Not much of England and Wales, with heavy rain in places, brighter in Scotland and in Northern Ireland, a high of 11 degrees Celsius. From Global's newsroom, you're up to date. Max is dreaming of riding a giant chameleon whilst fighting a clan of ninjas. Mm. But in reality, he's helping fight COVID-19 in his sleep. Like thousands of others, he's joined the Dream Team. By using the Dream Lab app, they're helping scientists speed up the search for potential treatments. I'll fight you. You go, Max. Search Vodafone Dream Lab and join the Dream Team tonight. Dream Lab app is owned by Vodafone Foundation, an independent charity. Registration number 1089625. Full terms at vodafone.co.uk slash dreamlab. This is LBC from Global. Leading Britain's conversation with Nick Ferrari at breakfast. Put your questions to Matt Hancock now. 0345 6060 973. This is LBC. Good morning to you all. It's four minutes after eight on Tuesday, April the 28th. Let's get straight to our conversation with Health Secretary Matt Hancock, who joins me now. Uh, initially, Mr Hancock, uh, thank you for coming to you. I trust you and the family are all well, sir. Uh, yes, we're, we're OK. Fully Good. recovered. Good to hear. Well done. I wonder, and I've got to ask you, this front page of the newspaper, the Daily Mail, you've probably seen, or one of your colleagues, so-called Doctor's Desperation. You'll be aware that this poll by the Royal College of Physicians shows that one in four are forced to reuse vital protective clothing. Notwithstanding the phenomenal job you and your colleagues have done of getting kit into the country, this is wholly unacceptable, isn't it? Well, we've, people need to have the PPE according to the guidelines. The guidelines do say that in some cases PPE can safely be reused, and that's a good thing uh, because this is uh, you know, PPE is in global short supply. But we've got a huge program underway to to make uh, equi the equipment here, to buy it from abroad and then to distribute it right across the NHS and the social care system and to others who need it. We've so far distributed a billion items. Uh, I'm, I've, I've seen that um, the particular uh, survey that you mentioned. Um, it, it's not actually a representative sample, uh, but it doesn't take away from the fact that you know, there's a huge effort, a very important effort underway to get people the protective equipment they need. Well, let me ask you this. Uh, when lockdown is lifted and as Health Secretary you visit a hospital, would you wear a kit that had already been used once before and was meant to only be worn once? Uh, if, if that is what is clinically advised, then yes, of course. And but if it's meant the, to be worn, um, and that's what's happening, Mr Secretary, Secretary of State, of course, in some instances they're having to wear kit again when it's designed for one wearing only. Well, and, and sometimes what we've managed to do during this crisis is, uh, is improve ways that a uh, kit like that can be uh, can be sterilised and then safely reused, um, and that's a uh, that that's work that's been ongoing. It's all about keeping people safe, mm. and making sure that we can get the PPE, but also if it is safe to sterilise it and reuse it, then that's okay. And uh, but on all of this, on all of this, uh, Nick, you won't be surprised to hear me say this. On all of this. I'm guided by the clinical evidence of what is clinically right, of what the doctors say is right. My job is to then, you know, is to get the logistics in place. And we've brought in Lord Dighton, who delivered the Olympics. Uh, he's been in post now for just over a week, and he's doing a fantastic job at, uh, at really getting that PPE supply chain in place. Let's get to the calls. That's what this is all about. You won't be surprised. The first call is concerning PPE. It's Intisar mm -hmm. in Hornchurch. Go ahead, Intisar. You're through to Matt Hancock. Good morning. Hi there, Mr Hancock. You might know my father, Dr Chowdhury. When he was unwell, he wrote an open letter to the Prime Minister pleading for more PPE for NHS frontline workers. It was a request that was ignored. Two weeks later, he passed away, and since then, over 100 NHS and social care workers have passed away from contracting the virus. Do you regret not taking my dad's, my dad's concerns, my 11-year-old sister's dad's concerns, and my wife's husband's concerns seriously enough, my dad that we've all lost? I'm into so I'm really sorry to uh, about your, your dad's uh, death, and... Um, I'm, I, I've seen the comments that you've made and um, what you've said in public and I'm, I think it's very brave of you to uh, be speaking out in public. We, te we took very, very seriously what your father said uh, and we've been working round the clock to ensure that there's enough protective equipment. Um, and in the case of anybody who works in the NHS or in social care, 
and has died from coronavirus. We look into it in each case uh, to find out the reasons where they might have caught it and what lessons we can learn. So absolutely, the, um, the, it's very important that these lessons are learned uh, and we find out what, is, uh, what, what we need to find out. But what I can assure you, Intisar, is that we took very seriously your, uh, your father's concerns that he raised uh, and we are absolutely uh, doing everything we can to get people the PPE they need. Do you accept now that mistakes were made, notwithstanding the fact, as you say, you've moved about a billion bits of kit to 58,000 different sites, which is no mean feat. Do you accept, Health Sec Mr Secretary of State, that mistakes were made? Well, uh, wow. I mean, Emmanuel Macron it's can in France. Can, can you be yeah. big enough to say, yes, we could have done things differently and we could have done them better? Well, there are things that we've, um, we've changed as we've gone through, both because we've learnt more things about the virus, also because things didn't, weren't, you know, didn't um, work out as we expected. I'll give you one example is that we changed the rules on, on who can go to a funeral. Uh, I saw that the, I saw the, um, the body of the 13-year-old boy who died uh, being um, laid to rest by uh, four men in hazmat suits and his family um, felt that they shouldn't go to the funeral and I thought that was awful um, and that was because the way that the guidance had been written um, it implied that even the close family shouldn't go and so we changed the guidance so yes we, we, we're constantly looking and learning for what we can do better but will you accept last on this point the provision of kit mistakes were made or you still say they weren't well what I say on the provision of uh, protective equipment is that a huge amount of people are doing everything they can and have done since the start okay. of the crisis okay. and you know of course this is a very very complicated logistical effort but I don't want to um, play down the right. enormous efforts of many thousands of people who are working okay. uh, every hour that there is they to are, try to indeed. solve the problem. Final word to you Intersar before I move on uh, briefly if you could sir. Yeah Mr Hancock the public is not expecting the government to handle this perfectly none of us are expecting Perfection. We're expecting progression. We just want you to open the yeah. knowledge that there have been mistakes in handling the virus, especially to me and to so many families that have really lost loved ones as a result of this virus and probably as a result of the government not handling it seriously enough. Openly acknowledging your mistake is not an admission of guilt. It's genuinely just making you seem more human. So could you please do that for me? Maybe yeah. today we're at a press conference today. Maybe a public apology. In well, I, 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 yeah. I, I, I think that it is very important that we're constantly learning about how to do these things better, um, and uh, and I think taking you know listening to the voices on the front line uh, is a very very important part of how we how we improve. All right. Well, we have tried. Intasar, condolences, and I'm sure I pass them on from Mr. Hancock as well to you and your family and what you're going through at the moment. Absolutely. Vic Victor and Loughton. Victor, you're through to Matt Hancock. Go ahead, Victor. Good morning, sir. Uh, hello, uh, Mr. Hancock. Right, I, I've got, I run a care home in Loughton. It's a very small care home, 50 bed at home. I had 50 residents when this started out. We protected them well. We received some PPE equipment, about 300 masks. Mm -hmm. Then, unfortunately, at the hospitals, and I really, I must admit, I was a bit disappointed. They sent a resident in with COVID-19. Mm -hmm. And in the process, we lost 12 residents. That's mm. very, I, I've At got to move moment, you to your I'm question. I'm really burning because my, my PP equipment, I cannot get it anywhere. Right. I actually had to buy it from somebody who came with a, uh, some equipment outside with his car. And, and Victor, uh, can I just ask, is your home privately owned or is it NHO? Who, who actually owns your, your residential home? It's privately owned. It's privately owned. Okay, because mm. there are there, there is a conversation to be had about the people who own some of these homes and the provision of kit. Although, of course, the health and well-being of all the citizens falls to Health Secretary Matt Hancock. Back to you. It does, and you know the responsibility sits on my shoulders, Nick. And uh, it's true that care homes um, historically have used PPE, of course, and um, there are seven or eight big suppliers of protective equipment to care homes. And most care homes in this country are privately run, as is Victor's, uh, and that's the way that they've always got PPE. But we have, uh, because of the need to increase the amount of PPE, we've stepped up and put in place extra processes uh, and, and allowed the access to the NHS um, 
PPE distribution uh, and expanded that to care homes. Um, but there is... Um, you know, so I, uh, you know, it, it, just because it's a private home doesn't mean no, that we don't have a responsibility to get the the PPE there. And I'm not going to say you know it's a it's a matter for the care home. It's actually a matter for all of us. And exactly as Victor says, because you know when this horrible disease gets into a care home, you know some of the most the people who are most vulnerable to it live in care homes. Uh, it's a problem people have been grappling with around the world. One of the things that we've done is introduced testing for everybody leaving hospital going to care homes to avoid the situation that Victor talks ah, about. So just to clarify, someone, let's say an elderly person takes a fall or whatever it might be, is treated for another matter in a hospital, he or she will not be discharged until they have seen, been seen not to have coronavirus. Is that correct, Health Secretary? That's absolutely, that, that's, okay. that's right. correct. Okay. And, and that testing happen, it now happens to, to try to stop this um, you know, the spread yes. of the disease to between the hospitals vulnerable. and care yeah. homes. Yeah, Absolutely. Indeed. Victor, good luck with the work you're doing. Desperately trying circumstances. You're on the front line. We'll all be thinking of you and your colleagues, of course, not just this Thursday at 8, but 11 o'clock as well when there's a minute silence we'll be observing on this radio station. Thank you, Victor. Carol in Cheltenham, you're on the radio. Your question to Matt Hancock. Good morning, Carol. Uh, good morning. Um, yes, um, I live about a mile from Cheltenham, race course um, and after advice the festival went ahead in March with about a quarter million visitors plus hundreds of the local people working there. The result is now I live in a very hot spot. On balance um, and reflection do you think um, it was a good idea to go ahead and would Mr Hancock um, commit to having a, a review of the scientific advice the government he's as he's received and the management of the pandemic and um, would the results be published there is anecdotal evidence of course secretary of state that the cheltenham festival has turned out now to be a lot of people did contract the disease was that a mistake well there'll be a time for a review of that won't there um and i've absolutely no doubt that the sort of review um the called for uh, will happen uh, and quite rightly because we need to learn in case there are future pandemics like this you know this disease is um is novel and, and and new um and the country hasn't faced anything like it before so of course we've got to learn those lessons uh, we followed the uh, the scientific advice we were guided by that science um i think that broadly we took the right measures at the right time um there's a um we were ahead of many other countries in europe in terms of when we took the measures um and that's you know the, the, that that's all that's what you can that's what you've got to do in these circumstances acting with uh, imperfect information uh, as we are all the way through it and learning were there no voices suggesting you postpone cheltenham um at the uh, no the science at the time was was quite um was quite clear um and the scientific advice that we were getting was quite clear can we uh, say that was wrong then mr hancock that was clearly wrong now wasn't well it? that that itself is a is going is a scientific debate that no doubt will uh, be um be discussed for many years to come you see the reason that they did the scientists didn't want us to move um earlier is because once you go into lockdown um the 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 resilience and the um and people's um willingness to stay in lockdown is a, and, and the economic consequences mean that it's only uh there's only a certain amount of time that you can hold that in place and i mean we're seeing that playing out now with calls to come out of lockdown even though it is too soon to do so safely um and so you have to that we have to we had to take that into account as well um, and uh, and that was uh, the basis of the scientific advice that we that we do, that we do you followed. Feel and I, but I think li you know listening to listening to the science is a very very right. important part of how you do your job but in these in do, these circumstances. Do, do you feel lockdown fatigue is is starting to set in a little bit, and and therefore the conversations about some form of easing of restrictions needs to be had as a matter of urgency? Not really, not amongst the public. If you look at the um, at surveys of the public, if you talk to members of the public. Um, if you looked at, at how much the public are following the uh, the measures, um, the public are following the lockdown brilliantly. There's a big there's a media debate about it, mm. and I understand that. Uh, but actually, the the proportion of the public who support the lockdown remains absolutely solid. But 
um, and the number of people who are um, who are who are uh, following the rules remains incredibly high, and the number of people who are taking taking journeys, for instance, is is barely changed on three weeks ago. So that that is good, but you know there are, there are clear consequences of the lockdown. Um, there are social consequences, there's economic consequences, and for some people. Um, yes. Especially the the shielded, there are there are health consequences, and we've got to take those into account too. So, for instance, you know the 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 fact that not enough people are coming forward with um, with suspected heart attacks or with suspected cancer. You know, the number of people getting cancer hasn't won't have fallen no. the, medically. That couldn't have happened, but the number of people coming forward with suspected cancer has, and we know that early detection of cancer li- saves lives. So you've got to take all of these into account. OK, just finally, before we move to you, Jude, you'll be the next caller, but on the subject of sport, uh, Secretary of State, you'll possibly have heard that the Premier League is thinking of resuming yeah. games by June the 8th. How realistic is that yeah. in your view? Well, I, I don't know, and I haven't seen the details of it, but I do think that trying to find a way f- to have uh, to have um, socially distanced sport as much as as possible behind closed doors and following uh, good public health rules, I think there's. I do think that there's uh, value to exploring that. Um, I know the again. Can't socially distance, of course, can they? Um, well, not whilst they're tackling each no. other, but uh, but the uh, but the um, uh, but certainly they can in terms of um, changing and everything off the pitch. Uh, and I know that the horse racing uh, uh, fraternity are also looking at how they can do socially distanced behind closed doors horse racing. And I think that these are th- important things to explore and then to to so- tackle the practical questions that they raise. And 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 I know that my. Uh, the public health experts uh, who work for me are engaged in with football and uh, and racing. So I do think it's doable, but a lot of work needs to be done to find a way okay. to make it happen. And June eight doable potentially. Well, I, I don't know. I don't know about the dates. That right. that all depends on, um, okay. on on getting those practical things in place as well as the spread of the virus. It's too soon now. I can tell you that. Okay. Uh, you mentioned cancer. Jude in Exeter is on that subject. Jude, you're through to the health secretary. Go ahead. Good morning. <laughs> Yeah, my question um, to Mr Hancock is, why did you decide on a blanket policy to tackle COVID-19 across England when different communities were and still are experiencing very different levels of COVID infection? Um, That's a really important question, Jude, because we thought hard about this before making the decision. Um, The answer was that the spread of the disease when we brought in the social distancing measures, uh, that spread was happening everywhere in the country at different levels but still it was shooting up at ev- in every part of the country and there was a discussion about whether to do um, a, a policy that focused only on the areas with the greatest spread which at th- that time were London and uh, Birmingham uh, but we decided that because the spread was going up everywhere it was better to do things as a country there's also a big advantage to to everybody being in this together uh, and stopping the spread everywhere now the good news is that uh, for uh, people who are in the southwest like you jude is that the southwest is one of the least affected areas um, but bringing in the uh, social distancing measures uh, there has 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 managed to bring down and flatten the curve in the southwest as well as uh, elsewhere uh, around the country. So, so that's why we did it. There was a, there was a judgment. There's another question on the on the uh, I suppose on the way out uh, of this. Uh, yesterday, I was able to announce that uh, because the curve is flat uh, flat now, uh, we can restart some of the NHS uh, procedures that we had to stop. And that will be done on a local basis according to the local impact of COVID-19 on the local health service. So, for instance, I would expect that in the southwest, where the number of cases is much lower, um, they should, if it works locally, be able to get started again on some of the on some of the non coronavirus treatments in hospitals that are so important for people's people's health outside the the the, uh, the epidemic. Jude, look after yourself. Some questions now from the emails. Rachel in Bexley, what can the health secretary tell us about children now getting some kind of virus that has an inflammatory component, Mr. Hancock? Yes, I'm. I'm very worried about the early signs that in rare cases there are 
there's a, uh, a, a an impact of an autoimmune response in children that causes a significant disease. Um, that we put out at the weekend a a call across the NHS um, because some cases of this had been identified and then this call essentially says to doctors in other parts of the country have you seen this condition uh, and then um, then they collate the information and find out uh, find out what's going on um, it is a we haven't seen this information about this from elsewhere in the world one of the advantages of having the NHS is because you know we're all part of one NHS it means that um, we can we can spot re relatively rare conditions uh, that happen in a number of different hospitals. So I am worried about it. We're looking into it with uh, how great How grave urgency. might it be, Mr. Hancock? Can it can it prove fatal? Or we don't know yet. Um, well, we don't know yet. We haven't um, lost any children a, as yet, have we? That we know of. Um, we have um, we have we have lost some children. Uh, uh, in all of the instances I know of, they had quite significant underlying health, issues, health conditions but this new uh, but inflammatory disease can attack no that well, hold on, that's not yeah but this is for relative well, this is different this new inflammatory it is, strain it or is. whatever no one i just want to, to correct my, i just want to correct myself there are some children who have died um who didn't have underlying health conditions that i know of right uh, so i just correct myself but, but this is, is a fresh a, strain we're looking at now of some sort it's, it, it, it's a fresh um it, it's a new uh, disease that we think may be uh, caused by coronavirus and the co and the COVID nineteen uh, virus, um, we're not one hundred percent sure because some of the people who got it uh, didn't test, uh, hadn't tested positive. So we're doing a lot of research now, but it is something that we're 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 worried about. But what I would also stress is that it is rare. The number of although it is very significant for those children who do get it, the number of cases. It is small. Okay. Uh, Jamie in Loughborough, why aren't we wearing masks like they are in so many other countries, particularly in Asia, Mr Hancock? Well, the, the, again, this comes back to the, the scientific advice, because the scientific advice is that um, the, um, uh, the, the, the impact of wearing a mask is uh, relatively small, uh, unless you're in a clinical setting where you need to wear a, a clinical... Uh, mask and so it's the most important thing is that we have masks for those who need them in health and social care and other uh, key services um, there is a widespread debate but what we know for sure is that social distancing is much more impactful than wearing a mask so we've tried to keep our messages really crisp stay at home to protect the NHS and save lives you may have heard I say that before but the reason we repeat it is because it is the most important thing for bringing down the spread of this virus and you know wearing a mask um, so is something we keep under review for the general public um, but there is a uh, but it isn't nearly as important uh, one way or the other as following the social distancing rules all right let's come back to the questions Jakob in Isleworth go ahead Jakob good morning hi Hi, good morning. I'm an 18-year-old healthcare sciences student volunteering as a healthcare assistant on a coronavirus intensive care ward here in London. How long do you predict that the NHS will need to rely on volunteers for coronavirus? And what is your plan for those now trained volunteers for after that? Yeah, great question, uh, Jakob. I think that the response of uh, people like you who volunteered is has been one of the absolutely um, most positive things about this whole uh, terrible time that this the, that the country, the world, has been having. Uh, because you know the response of three three quarters of a million people to step forward when we asked um, is absolutely terrific many many more people have jo have applied to join the NHS and to work in the NHS uh, and uh, I, I really applaud this sort of volunteering and I applaud your volunteering Jakob uh, so thank you on behalf of your country for for stepping up I really appreciate it but how um, long will it absolutely be? absolutely we have plans both for um, encouraging people who've taken up volunteering in the NHS to do that uh, full time, you know, to do that onwards. There's no reason uh, that it should end. Um, there's uh, after nurses, volunteers are already the second biggest uh, group of with amongst the workforce in the in the NHS. So you can, um, there's no reason that anybody's volunteering should end as and when we um, we defeat this virus. Um, it's um, a, a, and also I hope that there's opportunities. 
um, for you to convert your volunteering into a career, Jakob. Um, that's a um, that's a job offer. Uh, but there's a uh, um, but so you know we we massively applaud volunteers in the NHS. Uh, and they do they do an amazing job, and I'm very very grateful to each is, and every one. Is it something in a sentence, Jacob? Something you might be interested in exploring? Yes. So um, I am a healthcare student and did want to convert okay. to doing medicine afterwards, but this well, is just great experience in the meantime. Well, not only yeah. is it great experience, it's it's great of people like you. And as the health secretary said, uh, fantastic work that you're doing. And we are thinking of you every Friday at eight pm. I assure you, people like you and all the others, Jacob. Thank you, Connor. In St Ives, you're through to the health secretary. Go ahead, Connor. Good morning to you both. Hello. Um, to the Health Secretary, exercise sickness obviously um, sickness. took place in 2016. Firstly, if, if you're following the science now, why wasn't the science followed then? And secondly, will you commit to publishing the findings of exercise sickness in due course, please? This was a sort of dummy run that showed there were certain areas that needed attention and has always been a point of contention for the media, at least, that we never actually saw operation sickness in full detail. Mr Hancock. Uh, yes, I, I'm not sure why this is um, uh, why the media why this well, is. Did it not um, show that there were holes and that we needed more kit and it wasn't acted upon? And look, it was before I was health secretary. Yes, but my, but I asked my officials to go back when this first came up in the in the press a few weeks ago, and check that everything that was recommended was done. And that's the assurance that I got. Um, everything that was appropriate to do was done. That's what I was told. Uh, it was it was before my time. What I can tell so you, so everything though, Connor, sickness pointed out, they acted upon, is what you were told. Every, uh, that was appropriate to do. That I, but I am. Um, um, I think that you know the the preparations that we had in this country were amongst the but, most extensive in the world. Um, but of course, you can't prepare for a, a virus that is itself. Completely, you know, new by its if, nature. If they were so good, why, in some instances, in the early days, were NHS workers having to wear bin bags? Um, well, the, the answer to that is that we had right at the start we had enormous stockpiles uh, of PPE, and the um, and the need to get the PPE from the stockpile to the front line is a massive logistical yes, effort. But health that secretary, went, that's that, not a level of preparedness, is it, health secretary? Staff wearing a bin bag. Well, no, of course not. Um, but, but the um, but needing to operationalise that when it uh, when the demand for PPE across the system understandably shot up in uh, in in very short order. I think the head of the army has called it the biggest logistical uh, challenge in forty years. So yes. yeah, we we fully acknowledge that it ha it's been imperfect. And my uh, but my answer directly to Connor's question is that. Um, that uh, I'm, I am assured that the lessons that needed to be learned from that uh, from that exercise in 2016 uh, uh, were learned. And and and, um, and and the other and the other point I suppose I'd say in response to it, Nick, is I'm spending all of my time, day and night, trying to work out how we best respond. There will be a time when people yes. can go back and ask questions about what happened in 2016 before I was health secretary. Uh, frankly. What matters is what do you do with what you've got now? And that's the most important question but, that I ask every day when I wake up. But you must also ask, I don't know whether you or any of your colleagues had sight of Panorama last night, but and again, this is before you were, your watch, before you were health secretary, there were 33 million uh, FFP3 respirator masks in the original procurement from 2009. Only 12 million were ever handed out, which means from my some maths, there's 21 million that went missing. I appreciate this was not on your watch, but this must make you think what is happening, and it, it causes a sense of unease among the public. You must be aware of that. Well, uh, look, I haven't seen the panorama, but um, I, I'm not sure that all the claims made in it were... Uh, were complete uh, a reflection of reality. I mean, we are, we are dealing with a well, uh, understandably febrile um, uh, media environment. The great thing is that the vast majority of the public are supporting the enormous efforts we're going to to try to sort out the problems that we face now, well, uh, rather than rather than engage in some well, of the finger pointing. Well, let, let's talk now, and there is no finger pointing here. You have said that we will have these 100,000 tests. You will have been aware that this question was coming your way, and you will have looked at yesterday's Thought figure. it might come up. Yes, indeed. You knew that was coming. We're at 37,024, which is a, a lift of nearly 8,000. You've got two days to go, and you're, well, a, w very, very short. How do you think you're going to make that number up? 
Well, the the plan. Look, the reason I set the target was to ra radically to increase the number of tests. Uh, we'd, we'd multiplied the number of tests available by five in March uh, and to 10,000 at the end of March. Um, and it was clear to me that we needed many, many more tests. And we've now multiplied it again by uh, more than three. Um, but the plan was always to have a big ramp up uh, at the end of April because I spent April putting in place the systems to take this from a um, an individual lab by lab process hand done to a essentially automated process with an automatic application uh, online which you can now do and then since that case went live at the end of last week we have seen exactly as you say a very uh, rapid rise and the the you know the information is that thirty seven thousand was for was the number done on uh, Sunday, uh, and um, there's a there's a plan to ramp it up all week. So you will announce a hundred thousand on May the first. Well, we're still on track, but it's a big big task. But we're, there's a lot of things that we need to get right, and um, so there's no guarantees in this life, uh, but we still are on track. Um. You'll be aware, of course, that Newmarket is in your constituency, so that you are obviously a gambling man. I wonder, and I hope that I give £100 to a charity of your choosing, which I sense is the NHS. Are you prepared to have a £100 wager? And I will never be happier to write a cheque for £100 when you deliver that 100,000 tests on May the 1st and the money goes to NHS charities. Are you up for the bet, Mr Hancock? Uh, I've got enough riding on this already, Nick. Um... <laughs> Well, I don't um, think under could look, be near or there, really, if you get it wrong, but do go on. Um, well, the, you know, the, um, the good news is that the number of tests is rising um, so yes. sharply. Um, and um, uh, 100 pounds and, and to uh, I suggest the NHS charity well you will you take my wager lastly it will, let's do it for hospices UK okay so we've got ourselves a bet and I will never be happier in writing a cheque for 100 pounds than you hitting that target I fervently fervently mean that I'm not sure of your timing do we have time for one more question Mr Hancock I'm one sorry. more question yeah, I think. okay We're thank you very over, much and then, I know important. I know you've got to meet I know where you have to be at nine and I don't want to get in the way Adrian's in Hernhill Adrian you're on the radio good morning yeah, morning. Uh, does Mr Hancock think he, he's actually done enough? Um, we actually own, own a small business. We own a pub. And our business yeah. has been ruined. And basically, yeah. a, a, any help that the government w w w are now doing is too little, too late. I mean, yeah. it, 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 well, you've got, the, you've got the new bailout, of course, which hopefully you were listening to, uh, for, which is going to be as available as, as of Monday. But I suppose, Mr Hancock, this speaks to lockdown. This speaks to allowing publicans, restaurateurs, hairdressers, gym owners, everybody else to start some form of normality. Matt Hancock. Yeah, look, Adrian, I, I I really feel for you. I, I come from a small business background. Um, I've often told the story that the reason I'm in politics is because uh, it nearly went bust for something completely outside our control as a family uh, in the early 90s. So I really, really feel for you. Uh, and um, the, the look, but the yeah, the fact is facing the the this virus which multiplies. Um, every few days if you just let it lie and and don't take action um, and kills you know tens of thousands of people and it would be hundreds of thousands if we didn't take action um, the the best way through this as a country is to get the new the level of new cases right down that is best for health but it's also best for the economy because the worst thing for the economy would just to have it continuing to uh, to, to rattle away in a way that we had to keep more social distancing measures on for longer or god forbid we had a second peak and we had to bring having relaxed things we had to then bring everything back i mean that would be that would be terrible for the economy and for confidence and so we do have to get the the level of new cases right down and then we can hold it down through testing and through tracking and tracing every single person who gets it um, and 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 being able to lift some of the measures, uh, I know some pubs have gone, for instance, um, have gone to um, uh, you know takeaways, and, uh, and some have made uh, differences. But that isn't possible for all, and we have put in place a massive economic response. But I appreciate again, we can't take away all of the injustices from this thing. It is a it you know it is a catastrophe and it, we're trying to manage it as best we possibly can but my heart goes out to you adrian and for all of the work that you've put in uh, over the years 
on your business okay. because there are some businesses, especially especially pubs, who have just been absolutely sman- slammed by this. And lastly, there was reports on the weekend that possibly the virus arrived in this country actually around January time or February. A tracker app suggested that. I'm sure you maybe have had sight of that or you've heard of that. Is that pos- a real possibility that we might have had it earlier in this country than we knew? Well, you can't rule it out, um, but also the what you need to do to understand that is to get the genetic code from the early cases. And I saw that on a tracker app. The challenge is that you're asking people a couple of months later to report their symptoms some time ago. And so um, you've got a, the, there's queries over the reliability of the, of the self-reported information. But um, I, we absolutely will look into all of those things. The best way through is, is as I say, through the, we can, we can decode the, the genes in the virus itself and that way you can see the path of the virus. But the, be- the best information we have is that it came to this country in large numbers from Italy and Spain during half term. And that's when it that's when it really seeded here. Grateful for your time. Good luck to you and all your colleagues out there on the front line. Health Secretary Matt Hancock appearing here on LBC where the news is next. Taking calls on LBC, the Health Secretary has insisted the right measures were taken at the right time to tackle the coronavirus pandemic. But Matt Hancock has admitted there are lessons to learn in the provision of personal protective equipment for health workers. Mr Hancock told Nick there's a value to finding a way to begin socially distanced sport as much as possible. Football authorities are stepping up plans with the hope of restarting the Premier League season behind closed doors in June.